Hi. Hello. We wanted to start a new series, and it's an important one because I think if there's any subject that the witnesses think they know all about, it's life after death. So when they're thinking about the demerits of the Church of Jesus Christ through the ages, hell and the Trinity often come up first as proofs that the churches can't know the truth about anything. So if you do leave the watch there, you're thoroughly disillusioned because you think certainly the churches are wrong about this, mm -hmm. even if the watch there is wrong about a lot of other stuff. Yeah. So I wanted to look at what a modern watch there publication what does the Bible really teach has to say on this issue. Revisiting the subject after all these years, I was not surprised to find the treatment in this book, published in 2005, re-edited in 2013 for this printing, is not different in, in their approach to things. There's no revisiting of the subject and examining again. Mm -hmm. So in the chapter 6 of this book, Where Are the Dead?, I thought we, we might profit from just reading over the way they approach it, the way they introduce the subject. In chapter 6, Where Are the Dead?, they start with what happens to us when we die, and they also address the issue of what really happens at death and what Jesus said about death. That covers the first two and a half pages. So here's the, the way they approach it in the first couple of paragraphs. These are questions that people have thought about for thousands of years. They are important questions. No matter who we are or where we live, the answers concern each one of us. In the preceding chapter, we discussed how the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ opened the way to everlasting life. We also learned that the Bible foretells a time when death will be no more. Revelation 21.4 Meanwhile, we all die. The living are conscious that they will die, said wise King Solomon, Ecclesiastes 9.5. We try to live as long as possible. Still we wonder what will happen to us when we die. When our loved ones die, we mourn, and we may ask, what has happened to them? Are they suffering? Are they watching over us? Can we help them? Will we ever see them again? The world's religions offers, offer differing answers to these questions. Some teach that if you live a good life, you will go to heaven, but if you live a bad life, you will burn in a place of torment. Other religions teach that at death, people pass on to the spirit realm to be with their ancestors. Still other religions teach that the dead go to an underworld to be judged and are then reincarnated or reborn in another body. Such religious teachings all share one basic idea, that some part of us survives the death of the physical body. According to almost every religion, past and present, we somehow live on forever with the ability to see and hear and think. Yet how can that be? Our senses, along with our thoughts, are all linked to the workings of our brain. At death, the brain stops working. Our memories, feelings, and senses do not continue to function independently in some mysterious way. They do not survive the destruction of our brain. The next subhead is what really happens at death, and this is where they get to the bottom line as far as the Watchtower's dogma is concerned. What happens at death is no mystery to Jehovah, the creator of the brain. He knows the truth, and in his word, the Bible, he explains the condition of the dead. Its clear teaching is this, and the next part they have italicized. When a person dies, he ceases to exist. That's the end of the italics. But this next sentence is very important too. Death is the opposite of life. The dead do not see or hear or think. Not even one part of us survives the death of the body. We do not possess an immortal soul or spirit. After Solomon observed that the living know that they will die, he wrote, quote, As for the dead, they are conscious of nothing at all. He then enlarged on that basic truth by saying that the dead can neither love nor hate and that there is no work, nor devising, nor knowledge, nor wisdom, in the grave. Sheol in Hebrew. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, and 10. Similarly, Psalm 146, 4 says that when a man dies, his thoughts do perish. 
We are mortal and do not survive the death of our body, the watchtower comments. The life we enjoy is like the flame of a candle. When the flame is put out, it does not go anywhere. It's simply gone. Hmm. Now, looking into this now, 30 years removed from the watchtower, I realize just how arrogant that statement is that the Bible clearly teaches this. Yeah. Because they've acknowledged in the prior paragraph that almost all religions on the planet don't believe this mm -hmm. and we have to be specific here and say yes also Judaism and Christianity and Islam it's not just the pagan religions that don't teach this mm -hmm. so where did all of these those that read the Bible as well as those that don't mm -hmm. ever get the notion that we do survive death so it's very important to look at the proof text notice there's only there's only three texts here that they've used mm -hmm. there's one that doesn't talk about life after death per se Revelation 21 4 just which just death says will end. death yeah. will be no more and then there's the classic starting text when witnesses think of life after death Ecclesiastes which we did some videos on that that we can yeah. link. Yeah. we will link uh, I think it's four right four videos we did on Ecclesiastes showing the contextual problem mm -hmm. but then they go to Psalm 146 that's also a default text if you look in the reasoning book these are the same two texts yeah Ecclesiastes and Psalms that they used there mm -hmm. and that I was trained to use almost yeah. 50 years ago yeah. when I started as a neophyte Jehovah's Witness but I think they believe if they say it uh, in such a direct way like that that you'll be convinced that somehow if you see in print it's clearly teaching uh, it is it's you know it's very absolute terms in which they s say things even when they explain it what was the quote there? When they say, when a person dies, he ceases to exist. Death is the opposite of life. They just, they just make dogmatic statement and think you'll, you'll be convinced by that. And then they back it up with a second text after they've quoted directly from Ecclesiastes, which is Psalm 146.4. We haven't dealt with that in a video yet. But let's just briefly comment right now that if you check that text in most modern translations, you realize, unlike Ecclesiastes, this is, which is a contextual problem at three levels, that is the immediate context, the Ecclesiastes context, and the Old Testament history context, mm -hmm. this one is a translation problem. Because most translations modernly translate that text, not, not his thoughts perish, but rather his plans perish. Mm -hmm. And if you read that one in context too, you realize, well, that fits in with the idea that when you die, no matter what plans or what extravagant dreams you have, they're all gone. Yeah. It's, it's not about your state you of consciousness. You can no longer act on them. Exactly. So with those two texts, you have contextual and or translation issues. Mm -hmm. So you can't start there. And then there's a historical problem with using Ecclesiastes or Psalms. Mm -hmm. First of all, they're in the Old Testament, but they're not even the beginning of the Old Testament. So in one of our videos, more than one actually, in dealing with Genesis chapters 2 and 3, we talked about the fact that the first reference to death and life in the Bible is Genesis 2. Mm -hmm. We'll put a link to those videos too. The issue is, does the Old Testament, that is the beginning of the Old Testament, agree with the New Testament on what is the definition, the right definition of life and death? Because again, in this book, in paragraph four, they've defined death biologically. Mm -hmm. So they're using science as that is what we can examine from our own perspective, not from the divine revelation. They're yeah. using science to establish what death and life are. Yeah. Not safe. Reasoning. Reasoning. Mm -hmm. And then they go on in the next subhead, what Jesus said about death, to use, or, or at least a address Jesus' analogy, the comparison Jesus makes. So mm -hmm. in paragraph 7 they explain what they mean. Jesus Christ spoke about the condition of the dead. He did so with regard to Lazarus, a man whom he knew well and who had died. Jesus told his disciples, Lazarus, our friend, has gone to rest. The disciples thought that Jesus meant that Lazarus was resting in sleep, recovering from an illness. They were wrong. Jesus explained, Lazarus has died, 
The reference is John chapter 11, verses 11 to 14. Notice that Jesus compared death to rest and sleep. Lazarus was neither in heaven nor in a burning hell. He was not meeting angels or ancestors. Lazarus was not being reborn as another human. He was at rest in death, as though in a deep sleep without dreams. Other scriptures also compare death to sleep. For example, when the disciple Stephen was stoned to death, the Bible says that he fell asleep. Acts 7, verse 60. Similarly, the Apostle Paul wrote about some in his day who had fallen asleep in death. 1 Corinthians fifteen six. I don't think these help is caught their cause at all. I suppose before we get into the comparison, notice first of all this statement in the middle: Lazarus was neither in heaven nor in burning hell. But if you if you if you're an educated Christian, you know that's not what the church is supposed to teach anyway. You don't yeah. go according to traditional eschatology in the churches. You don't go immediately to heaven or hell. Although it's true, millions of Christians think that. Yeah. But that's not the teaching of the church. The church is authentic. That is authoritative teaching from the beginning has been that there will be a judgment day. Yeah. We're all going to go to judgment day and we will all be resurrected and be rewarded yeah. according to our our uh, deeds, whether good or bad, which Jesus agrees with in John 5. And in, in, in uh, John 11 there, that's what his sister, his sister Lazarus' said. sister, expected. Yeah. Yes, I know, at the last day he will be resurrected. That was what she believed. So it's true that all Jews didn't didn't agree on what would happen, but none of them, except the Sadducees, thought that there was no life after death. So the great majority of teachers in Israel, including apparently the apostles, because after all Paul was a Pharisee, mm -hmm. would have believed that there was something that survived death. Mm -hmm. So the comparison, though, the comparison doesn't help itself, does it? No, it doesn't. Because when you're asleep, you're not uh, ceasing to exist. You know, you uh, but you're in a, a kind of of uh, hazed, uh, <laughs> a hazy you're, you're, uh, reality. Where it, we, what the what the Hebrews thought of as a suppressed consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if you look at most of the references to Sheol and to Hades, Sheol specifically in the Old Testament Hebrew text, it's usually thought of as a place of of uh, not non-existence but. A dream state, interestingly enough. Yeah, I mean, that's what they say in that verse. And it's not permanent. They don't yeah. think of it as the permanent state. The resurrection is the solution to this mm -hmm. long sleep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just as, as we, when we're in the in our sleep state, if we're in dream yeah. mode, we're, we're interacting with our environment even though we're not conscious of it. Sometimes yeah. even when you're asleep, you're thinking, I'm, I'm dreaming. Yeah, and sometimes and it, when you're half as, half yeah. awake, you, yeah, depending on what stage of sleep you're in, you can even be aware of sounds around you, uh, things happening, which are integrated so, into your dream. Yeah, so yeah. you're half asleep. You're in twilight zone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to compare s death to sleep is not helpful to the co to the to comparison the of non-existence. Yeah. it's a depressed or suppressed l state. State you can't even call it life. So that in Hezekiah, for instance, King Hezekiah, mm -hmm. when he thinks of of dying and his reasoning is, well, the dead cannot praise you. And mm -hmm. those that are in Sheol cannot praise you. But, yeah. but everybody who comments on that text and similar texts in the Old Testament make, make the point that he's not thinking he will not exist, rather that you can't really live while you're in that state. Yeah. You have no interaction with earthly life, which yeah. after all is the purpose of God, to give you Mm -hmm. and in enfleshed bodily existence right. that's that's what a human being is mm -hmm. so in other words he has to get his body back which is what the resurrection is mm -hmm. in order to live on earth yeah. mm -hmm. so in the next segment i wanted to sh compare what what the watchtower says about specifically about hades and gehenna with what this man William Vine says. William Vine is one of the world's great Greek scholars of the last hundred years, by the way, an exact contemporary of J.F. Rutherford. So we'd be interested to know what Mr. Vine says about life after death according to the Greek and the Hebrew texts. And used by the Watchtower. Yes.
frequently used by the watchtower. In the next segment.